So a month ago, you'll remember that as a leadership team, we invited you to join us in a day of prayer and fasting. We sought your uh, prayer support as we had a leadership uh, retreat day to pray and listen to God together to discern his leading and direction for our church in the coming year, especially as we sensed that the time is now right to move forward with the recruitment of a full-time ministry leader to join our leadership team. And on that day, we took time to review and reflect on our church vision and invited you all to do the same. And a significant outcome from the retreat day and actually other times when we have met together to pray as a leadership team in recent months, a significant outcome is a firm belief that the Lord is confirming and deepening the four broad themes he gave us as a church back in 2021 and encouraging us to think further and to give more specific expression to these themes. Therefore, we think it is important to use two Sundays to reflect and review our vision themes. So we're going to look at the content, uh, the biblical basis, and ask ourselves, you know, how are we getting on? Is the vision coming into reality? How can we see it uh, become more of a reality? So, a reminder of the four big themes. Firstly, blessing flowing from the loving heart of the Father. Then togetherness in the Father's family. Ministry to our neighbors. And all of this in the power of the Spirit. So I'm going to reflect on the first two themes this morning. Blessing and togetherness. And then John Morris will refresh our understanding of ministry and power in the Spirit next Sunday. As part of my preparation... I rewatched on our church YouTube channel the four talks in January 2022 when the vision team first shared this uh, vision with us. And I'd warmly encourage you to do the same because what you can see is the continuity and also the growth in these ministry areas over the last uh, couple of years. So let's look again at blessing that flows from the loving heart of the Father. Here's a reminder of the vision picture that was given in 2021 to a member of the vision team, the the transition team. Remember that team met every fortnight for six months. Here's a picture of the loving heart of God out of which flows, flows different but complementary blessings, each one with a different color, as you can see in that image. Blessings of care, worship, prayer, kindness, food, which we might interpret as loving, caring, practical hospitality. And then the flow of the Holy Spirit. On our recent retreat day, we recognize that blessing also comes from suffering and perseverance. So maybe we could add a black ribbon, if you will, to the picture. A sense that disappointing and sad experiences, though they are difficult and unwanted at the time, they are also used by the Lord to bless us in unexpected ways. And Hazel Morris actually drew out this aspect when she introduced the blessing theme in January 2022 Uh, looking at Isaiah 61. She described the blessing of a crown of beauty instead of ashes as something good in the middle of some really bad stuff. Beauty instead of ashes. But let's go back to the basics. What do we actually mean by blessing? It's a term that's become rather benign, even trivial, in our culture. Uh, We say, bless you, 
when someone uh, sneezes. It, it, it's kind of a way of covering over the embarrassment of a sort of trumpet snort from someone's nostrils, particularly if it's a very inappropriate moment, bless you. Uh, and then our American friends like to say, bless their heart. And it, it's more often actually a less kind way of pointing out a, a well-intentioned but naive and perhaps ignorant action. Bless, bless their heart. Well, we need to recover the tremendous depth and power of the term blessing. And the Bible very definitely does that. Right from the beginning of the Old Testament. Here we go, Genesis 1. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So after making humanity, the very first thing God did was to bless them. Okay, He first blessed them and then called them to work the earth. So we don't work for blessing, we work from blessing. We don't work for blessing, we work from blessing. We don't work to get God's blessing, we are already unconditionally blessed. We are deeply loved, wanted, and known by God, and that is what marks us as his image bearers in his world. So God's blessing is his settled, unchanging disposition to speak and cause Goodness, flourishing, growth, life, and purpose, and especially an intimate relationship with him. All these things to flow into the lives of those he has created. Let me, it's a big thought, that. let me just repeat that. His settled disposition to speak and cause goodness, flourishing, growth, life, purpose, and above all, intimate relationship with him to flow into the lives of those he's created. Now, of course, humanity, right down uh, to us individually here today, have badly messed things up with our sin and rebellion. We think we can bless ourselves more effectively by making our own choices. Independent from him, we reject God's blessing. But remarkably, Despite this rejection of his blessing, God renewed his commitment to bless humanity through Abraham. Genesis 12 there. The Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Quite extraordinary. Not only was God promising unconditionally to bless Abraham and his countless descendants, but actually commissioned him and his descendants to be agents of blessing to everybody else in the world. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So the well-known phrase that our transition team often refer to, we are blessed to be a blessing. We are blessed to be our blessing. This blessing from the Father is not for us to keep to ourselves. It's for our neighbors and our community and the people of Warwick too. I'm reading that straight from our vision statement. Now back in the Old Testament, God gave the newly formed people of Israel, freed from Egypt, his law, and sacrificial system to help them live out the covenant with him and so demonstrate to all the other nations round about them the beautiful love, the righteousness, and the justice, both of the character of God and the way of living that he prescribed. Both were beautiful, both were effective, both would be a blessing and bring blessing to others. God also gave them priests so that when the people of Israel failed, sacrifices for repentance could be made and the blessing renewed. So the priests could be the channel of God's 
fresh blessing to his people. And so the famous high priestly blessing that was another key verse in this area of our vision. Number six, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Many of you know that uh, Old Testament Israel increasingly rejected God's laws and ways, even though they were expressly designed to bless them. And so curses and exile were the inevitable consequences of their rebellion. But God had anticipated that this would happen. And so another channel of blessing emerges, a mysterious and unexpected suffering servant, a special anointed one, a a Messiah that God began to speak to the prophets about, especially Isaiah. And so to another key scripture for us, Isaiah 61, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the, for the prisoner. So the mission of blessing given to all Israel has narrowed down now and is focused on a single person, the Messiah. And at the start of his ministry in the synagogue in Nazareth, Jesus read this very scripture and embraced this vision, this mission, to be the sole agent of God's blessing. As the only perfect Israelite who, com- who was completely obedient to God's law, he was then able to broaden out the mission again through his death and resurrection in place of sinful humanity. He was able to open up the channel again for us to receive God's blessings. But not only that, he also enables us to join him and resume the mission of Adam and Abraham, their original role to be agents of blessing to the rest of the world. Notice how the mission of blessing is reinforced, is reinforced by Jesus in the very last words of Luke's gospel. He has commissioned disciples to go out into the world to take the gospel. And then he says, when he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continuing at the temple, praising God. In summary, God wants a people who live from blessing to be agents of blessing, to model a new way of life, and then distribute that new way of life to the ends of the earth. Okay, that all sounds very wonderful, magnificent, and huge in scope. But let's get much more practical. How how do we actually go about blessing people? I want to consider one aspect, how we can bless people through what we say, how we can speak blessing into others. Have a look at this quote from uh, Christian author John Ortberg. See what you think of this. Blessing and cursing are not compartmentalized Bible words at all. They are simply the two ways that we treat people They are as inseparable as breathing in and breathing out. Now, we we might think that we actually handle people in in a more nuanced way, perhaps uh, uh, balancing or offsetting encouragement on the one hand with criticism and correction. But Ortberg, and I believe the Bible, is saying either blessing or cursing will win out. John Ortberg again. I used to think that cursing someone meant swearing at them or putting a hex on them. So it was pretty easy to avoid because I don't swear much or do hexes. But I realized how wrong I had been. You can curse someone, 
with an eyebrow. You can curse someone with a shrugged shoulder. I have seen a husband curse a wife by leaving just the tiniest delay before saying, of course I love you. Here is the key biblical insight I want to share with you. The words we speak can have tremendous power. Proverbs 12 verse 18 declares, The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Let me say that again. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings uh, healing. As John Tyson, my current favorite pastor in New York, puts it, we can shape hearts and minds and identities by the things that we speak into, uh, into others. I, I suspect we can all remember something negative that our parents or a teacher said to us as children that stuck with us for years. Stuck with us for years when the reality was they were probably just tired and a bit exasperated with us. But, but here's the dynamic in play. John Tyson again. A thoughtless word can become the splinter in the soul that if infected by the lies of the enemy can produce lives of pain and despair. Notice the arch tactic of Satan is to persuade us to believe that those thoughtless words were true and true continually, not just in that incident and, and, and not to the extent that we take those irrationally as we dwell on unjustified criticism. Uh, when I watched uh, James Rose's talk on the togetherness element of our vision, and don't worry, I am moving on to that one that part soon, I was reminded of what he called the grievance narrative and his analogy of flying in a plane. He talked about how we let harmful words fester, fester in ourselves, kind of like when we're sitting down and strapping in the, uh, the safety belt as we're, as we're ready for uh, takeoff on the plane. And, and, and we share our grievance with other passengers and invite their sympathy and their condemnation of the person who has hurt us. And eventually, we try and resolve the situation and attempt to land the plane. But, but just as we're getting close to the ground, the, the, the anger, the frustration, the bitterness wells up and woof, the plane takes off again. And we, we go for another round of the grievance narrative. But just as words of cursing can be powerful and destructive, so words of blessing be equally powerful but constructive. That quote from John Tyson again, we can shape hearts, minds, and identities by the things that we speak into others. So can I suggest there's a safe and a risky or bold way of speaking blessing to another person? Actually, both are very valuable to the person on the, the receiving end. The safe way is what we might call blessing of noticing. By this, I mean we aff affirm or encourage someone by pointing out specific evidence of a way in which they have um, encouraged or done something well or benefited us. And it's not just saying uh, something general, like you led the service well today, uh, Sarah, but picking out something specific. That's a really helpful illustration with the, the children and their parent to uh, s explain how we recognize uh, our loving he Heavenly Father. So blessing someone on the basis of clear, specific evidence. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy doing that. But the risky or courageous blessing is the blessing of empowerment. This is a blessing that is based on potential, not actual evidence. It stakes a claim of faith in a hoped-for future, but a future that is not yet certain, that cannot be seen. When I shared this thought with Jamie on our retreat day, he said that's what he does all the time as a youth pastor. 
He has to see the hoped for future flourishing of a young person where there may be only the faintest glimpse or speck of that possibility at the moment. <clears throat> Jamie's comment got me thinking. And I remembered many years ago that as a student, I got to lead a short-term mission team of young people to Argentina with Latin Link. We were working alongside a local church as they reached out to vulnerable children in slum areas around Buenos Aires. And we were often asked to lead activities with the children. So one obvious thing was to act out Bible stories since our Spanish wasn't really uh, very good. Now, Jono was on our team. He was a kind and gentle fellow, but very underconfident. In the UK, he'd struggled to find his place and he seemed to have limited skills. Well, by accident, over the banter of preparing the tea meal together, um, Jono spontaneously broke into a little acted impersonation of jelly on a plate. <laughs> it, it, was, it was very fun. I can't remember why he did it. Maybe we were literally having jelly as, as dessert. But his act was energetic and funny. So, so inevitably, I asked him to start taking part in our Bible story mimes and sketches for the children. He was very reluctant, but I pushed him. I actually pushed him <laughs> quite hard, and in the end, he agreed. Well, over several sketches, we all saw his confidence grow. He was amazing. But not only that, we noticed how his simple, even naive ways that actually held him back in the UK were the very things that enabled him to connect with the children in the slums of Buenos Aires. He connected more deeply and authentically than the rest of us. A few years later, Jono returned to Latin America as a long-term missionary in Peru with Latin Link. I realized that by blessing Jono's acting, I had staked a claim in his hoped-for future, and God had disproportionately used my simple word of empowerment as part of Jono's discipleship journey. Okay, so much for words of blessing. A second major way that we can fulfill our mission to be agents of God's blessing to the world is by being together, by our unity as a Christian community. So that brings us to the second theme in Saltisford's vision, togetherness or unity in the Father's family. The most classic and beautiful expression of how blessing comes from the togetherness of believers is that pearl of a psalm 133. Let me read it again. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon. As if the Jew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life evermore. <clears throat> First of all, notice that when Christians live and serve in harmony together and are like minding, it is good. It is factually good. Good things actually happen. So, 36 children and 26 parents and carers were blessed as they were welcomed into the happy, safe space of Autism Cafe yesterday. Or, people who are unwell are blessed when we pray for them and visit them in hospital. Okay? It is good. But secondly, this unity is also pleasant. It feels good. It is delightful to be at peace and harmony with one another. It is both satisfying and enjoyable to serve together. The writer of the psalm then shares two wonderful pictures of blessing that emphasize the extraordinary abundance, the sheer quantity of blessing that flows from the togetherness of God's people. The first is the anointing of the high priest. Now, we tend to think of anointing as sort of dabbing a, a single drop of oil on someone's forehead. But the picture here is much bolder and much more extravagant. 
the expensive and fragrant perfume that Moses was told to, to create for this occasion is poured, not just dabbed, on Aaron's head. It quickly saturates his hair. It flows down onto his beard, then onto his collar, and down into his tunic. You know, I wonder if a, a trickle of oil actually went down the, 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 the back of his neck, down his spine to the, to the base. You know, that kind of think about that. Um, the, 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 this shows that God's anointing and appointing of Aaron to be a channel of blessings to the people of Israel is something massive and unstinting. It is a total and full life calling and will continuously express the relentless love of the Father to persistently bless his people. The comparison means that our Christian unity, our togetherness, will have similarly disproportionate and multiplying results. Then the second picture reinforces this and shows a miraculous dynamic in play when God multiplies the blessings that come from his people living together in unity. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. Mount Hermon was, and still is, a tall mountain in northern Israel, often snow-capped, but known for its heavy dew falls. Mount Zion is really a collection of smaller hills about 100 miles much uh, further south in a much drier and arid climate. So it would be an extraordinary weather miracle if Hermon's massive amount of dew was transferred to Mount Zion. But that's the inspired picture the psalmist uses to remind us, okay, on the one hand, we've got the, the special blessing of salvation that comes through the high priest who is for us uh, Jesus. There's that, but also these wider blessings of Jew representing uh, life-giving um, growth and abundance across every area of, of life. The, the, that rain, that Jew, causes food to uh, grow. There is health. There is uh, growth of families. There is shelter. But this isn't a prosperity gospel. Rather, it's saying that when God's people live out his covenant, live out the gospel together. People don't just get saved, but everything in the world and our communities has the potential to flourish again. It is a massive vision. And it's not just the here and now. Verse 3, for there the Lord bestows his blessing. That's the now, even life forevermore. So we get to join in seeing in seeing God's kingdom of blessing come into reality more and more in our world here and now. But one day, it will be fully established eternally forevermore. Okay, that's another pretty mind-blowing and ideal picture. Right, back down to earth. Begs the question, what does Christian unity in a church look like? How do we get it? And once we've got it, how do we keep it? Okay? Right. Back in Bible college... A lecturer once explained to me that there are essentially four kinds of church community. Over the years, I found this framework really helpful, and so I'm going to share it with you now. Also, I know that you engineers and teachers out there love a good quadrant. So here's our quadrant. It has diversity on one axis and unity on the other. Okay. Let's go through the quadrant. So, when a congregation consists of very similar people, low diversity, but little sense of common purpose or vision or togetherness, low unity, they are like seeds of a single variety in a sealed packet. So they're all, say, carrot seeds. There is uniformity, but no growth. You either stay in the packet and do nothing, or you get up and you get fed up and leave that church. Okay. Then there is the church that's full of similar people, low diversity, but with a high sense of unity. This is the melting pot. The community is intense, but there's no space for a different voice to challenge or renew the status quo. Those who are different find they either have to compromise to fit in, or they have to quit that church. So, so it's a case of either jumping into the melting pot or leaving the kitchen. 
Thirdly, there is a church that is highly diverse in its membership, but weak in its sense of unity. This is the bouquet of flowers church, where each distinct person blooms in their particular ministry. It looks very attractive and active, but because no one is really supporting or helping uh, anybody else, there is high level of burnout of people and ministries. Lastly, there is the church that consists both of great diversity and great unity. This is the body church. No surprise there in the use of the scriptural image. You'll remember the very important passage in 1 Corinthians 12. Let me read it to you again. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. A church that, that is this kind of body compromises distinct members, distinct members who complement and support each other in a way that results in fruitful and enduring ministry. But here's the crucial point. The unity of the body church is not is not uniformity or merger. It's not a melting pot or a packet of seeds. It's not a fleeting bouquet of unconnected diversity. Rather, it is unity through diversity. Unity through diversity. Now, that's easy to say, but it's difficult to explain, and I think can only really be experienced and to be understood. But the very good news is that it is possible, not because of our own efforts, but because it is modeled after and empowered by God himself as three persons. The Trinity, the way God relates to himself as Father, Son, and uh, Holy Spirit, is the ultimate proof and guarantee that we can be truly together while distinct and different in our church family. How does this work? Well, do you notice how often John's gospel records how the Father, Son, and Spirit behave towards one another? I'm just going to take one or two examples from John chapter 14. So first of all, the Father. Um, Jesus says to Philip, don't you believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you I do not speak on my own authority, rather it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. So the Father sends his Son into the world to, com to accomplish his mission of blessing. But notice the wonderful flow of respect and love that goes out and back. For example, as the Father sends the Son, so the Son in turn asks the Father to send the Spirit. Then the Spirit primarily points people back to Jesus. John 14, 25, the Holy Spirit will remind you of everything I, Jesus, have said to you. And then Jesus, in turn, directs us back to the Father. Verse 9 of chapter 14, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Do you see that in every action, each member of the, the Trinity constantly pushes the other into the line? No, you, you, Father. The Father says, no, you, the Son. And the Son says, no, the Spirit. Do you, you see this beautiful dance, as it's sometimes been uh, referred to? They deflect attention away from themselves and onto the other. Crucially, because this honoring and respecting of each other is so perfectly mutual, each person of the Trinity is not diminished but enhanced as they point away from themselves to the others. So for us here at Saltishwood, we can have very different personalities, abilities. We can actually degree, disagree on secondary issues of faith. But if we do so with mutual love and submission to one another, our unity will be powerful. Those seeking God will marvel that people as different as we are from each other are together and get along so well. And they will be attracted to our community and above all, they will be attracted to Jesus. 
And so finally, to the climax of the argument, which also brings us to the key verse for the transition team when bringing the theme of togetherness. John 17. I pray also for those who will believe in, th in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Here's the most encouraging thought of all. We can experience unity through diversity. We can be truly together, though different, because God as Trinity comes to live in us by his spirit. His presence miraculously causes that mutually submissive love for one another to grow in us. That is amazing. So to conclude, as we reflected on blessing and togetherness on our leadership re retreat, we affirmed again the picture given to the transition team of a, uh, a sink of pots and jars of all different sizes, shapes and conditions. It's a bit of a rubbish picture. That was the best I could get on the internet without paying some money. But, but the, the, the image is much richer. We've got pots and jars and cups of different sizes and the water is pouring in and it fills each of those vessels and then it starts to overflow and part of the vision was that, that some of the pots are in poor condition, they're broken and um, weak and so God's blessing flows into our church of people of all types including many of us who are broken, worn down and needing help and here's the thing the blessing comes despite and through our limitations and weakness. And remember also this illustration of robust Christian togetherness that Susanna gave us. There's uh, James and Jamie helping each other cross the shark-infested stormy waters, which represents all the external pressures in our lives and in our, in our culture. Um, <clears throat> And Jamie was also supporting James as he was carrying that rucksack representing all the personal burdens and pressions in his own life and in, 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 in his situation. And remember, James tried and failed to cross the ladder bridge when he was on his own. But they crossed the ladder bridge safely because they were together. To be agents of God's abundant blessing into his world we don't need to be perfect, but we do need to be together. Can I invite you to take a moment to pray personally? Ask God to show you where and to who can you give a word of blessing. Maybe it's a word of noticing, a safe one. Maybe it's a word of empowerment, something a bit more risky. Also, ask God to show you how can I contribute to the unity through diversity of this wonderful church family? How can we see that unity grow so that those seeking the Lord will be magnetically drawn to our community and to our loving Lord Jesus? So please take a, a moment to pray uh, quietly, and then I'll invite Sarah to come and further a lead response.